particularly within the um, low carb carnivore keto community, there's been a lot of people who, you know, have been responsive to the message and enthusiastic about the book. And, and I appreciate that. Uh, you know, at the, at the uh, same time, I, of course, you know, want to to get the message out, not to people that already have some familiarity mm-hmm. with this, but, you know, to to a larger community. And a lot of times the, the responses I, I'm most happy about is somebody who has no familiarity with, you know, doesn't even know what insulin resistance is or anything before reading the book and then comes to it and has a new appreciation. And I've had some scientists and cancer scientists say that, you know, I, I alerted them to a lot of stuff they didn't know about, which is, you know, really flattering. And, you know, one cancer scientist um, said to me that, uh, you know, as he was reading the book, he was eating a piece of carrot cake and he, he sort of put it aside. I thought that was a nice, a nice compliment. Good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good morning. We've got a great guest today. Mr. Sam Apple joins us here. Sam, Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, welcome. Well, thank you, first of all, for, uh, let me just uh, show it off, the the book that you wrote, uh, Ravenous, which I am, I've got about 80 pages left till I finish it, so I'm making my way through. It's been a wonderful, wonderful read, uh, really fascinating, really insightful. Um, would you mind uh, just, you know, aside from writing this book, would you give us a background history on, on yourself a little bit so people get to know who you are? Uh, sure. Uh, I teach uh, science writing at Johns Hopkins University and uh, also uh, creative writing. And um, I've been a, a journalist for many years. Uh, I did a, a graduate degree in uh, creative nonfiction. And about 10 years ago, uh, I started to drift more into the realm of science and, and nutrition writing. Uh, I was interested um, in low carbohydrate nutrition, in part uh, because I'd read the work of Gary Taubes and, and found it very compelling. And um, I really became interested in, in cancer, in particular, in part because I, I was so surprised to discover that cancer was a metabolic disease and, and sort of, uh, you know, appeared clustered together with, with diabetes and obesity uh, throughout the last century and a half. So it was, you know, really very different from my understanding of of cancer and what cancer risks were. So I just wanted to, to learn more as soon as I came across that information. Um, and then I, you know, I became interested in Otto Warburg because he had made one of the foundational discoveries in, in cancer metabolism. Yeah. It's, I mean, you know, when I went to medical school, I mean, it was very much somatic mutation, you know, the, and, and that's still a very persistent view. You know, we've got these genetic defects that lead to dysregulated growth, which leads to, you know, these, these sort of bizarre tumors and and so on and so forth and and i never i had never heard of otto warburg when i was in medical school never even was even considered or thought of um it's interesting you know i'm in reading the book you, you've obviously done just a ton of research i mean it's obvious i mean i can't imagine how much time it took to you know go through that and all the secondary source reading you must have gone through that how did you what made you to select otto warburg as you know i mean obviously his early work but i mean what, what drew you to, you know, it's interesting because he's in this, I mean, you paint this picture of not only the scientific stuff, but, you know, Nazi Germany was obviously a very uh, challenging place to, to, to live, particularly Warburg being, you know, of Jewish descent. And, and uh, you mentioned that he was likely homosexual. And so that would have been extremely challenging times. Uh, it's kind of a fascinating story. But how did you, how did you, what, what made you decide on Warburg? Were you doing some preliminary research and said, this guy's really interesting? Or how did that turn out? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much how it happened. I came to the science first and, you know, was just reading and I came across Warburg's name and it was really only a, a sentence or two that said, you know, he had made this important discovery. And then, you know, I Googled him. It's probably how most bur- books start today with just Googling somebody and uh, started, you know, I found a little bit, most of the material is actually in German, but I found a little bit in English, uh, you know, his Wikipedia page. And, um, you know, I was just fascinated by by his story, his biography of surviving in Nazi Germany, despite I mean Jewish heritage and being more or less openly gay. You know, he should have been the most uh, fearful person in Nazi Germany, but instead he sort of, you know, was outspoken and provoked the Nazis. So I, I was fascinated by that story. And, you know, as again, my background was in journalism and in sort of thinking about how to tell a story. I needed a central character. I needed a protagonist. In theory, you know, there were other people that were also very important to the development of cancer as a metabolic disease, but Warburg is sort of the central figure and he was so outspoken about it that it just made sense to focus on him. And, um, 
you know, it gave me a chronological story to tell from, you know, tracing his career. And I, I really needed that in order to construct a whole book. Yeah. And, and you, you know, you use him as a protagonist, but obviously he's, he's a flawed protagonist, I suppose. You know, you point, paint that he was not the best, you know, the easiest person to work with and very much obstinate in many ways and, you know, unwilling to compromise, which, you know, sometimes that's a hallmark of somebody that's, you know, driven and they want to get their, get their work out there. Um, what, I mean, what were some of the, you know, I guess, interestingly, I mean, you kind of imply that the reason Warburg might have been protected because he was working on cancer and Hitler was terrified of cancer having, you know, you know, I learned that his mother apparently succumbed to that. Was that, do you think that was a major driving factor in keeping him, keeping him alive or in the country? Yeah, I do. It's really, you know, the, the Hitler story is pretty incredible. He, you know, as you mentioned, his mother died of breast cancer and Hitler was sort of by her side in her last months trying to care for her and, and actually with, you know, by the side of a, a Jewish doctor who Hitler actually really liked. And this doctor said that, um, you know, he's never in his life seen somebody more depressed than, than Hitler as he stood by his mother's side and watched her die as a young man. And, you know, other historians have said it's, you know, he was, you know, a, you know, essentially a psychotic or sociopath. And, you know, he couldn't feel for anybody except for his mother it was the one person he, he was able to feel for. And, um, you know, then he becomes a hypochondriac, but, but cancer is always sort of his, his obsession, you know, various points. He just stops everything that he's doing and starts talking about cancer and even cancer and diet in, in some cases. And uh, so, you know, Warburg comes along and, um, you know, he has a lot of enemies even, even before the Nazis arrive, just because he's a difficult personality. And he really, you know, he refuses to give the Nazi salute. He refuses to put up the Nazi flag. And, you know, a lot of people want to get rid of him, at least chase him out of his institute. And, and they keep protecting him. And I, I think that uh, the best evidence is that, you know, had he not been focused on, on cancer, he would not have been able to retain his position. He was a member of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society, which had hundreds of Jewish scientists uh, before 1933. And he is the only one that makes it all the way till the end. And, um, you know, there's this fascinating incident that happens on June 21st, 1941, where they actually bring him into Nazi headquarters. And uh, you see that, uh, you know, according to Warburg's testimony, they told him directly that it was his cancer research that, that kept him there. And uh, that very day, Himmler's notebook shows that he had a meeting about Warburg. And uh, that night, Goebbels' diary shows that Hitler is talking about cancer research uh, right after Warburg left the building. But what makes it really incredible is that, you know, it turned out, I didn't even realize this when I started my research, that that was only hours before the Nazis uh, invaded the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa, which is really kind of the central moment in the Nazi campaign. And just hours before that, they're dealing with Warburg and cancer. So it, it sort of blew my mind that that all happened together. And it just shows you how obsessed the Nazis were. And it wasn't just Hitler. A lot of a lot of the top Nazis were very focused on, on cancer. And um, actually, the first experiments that took place in the concentration camps were cancer experiments. Yeah, you, you, you'd mentioned, you know, obviously, to my <laughs> amusement, that Hitler and, and some of the Nazis were quite fascinated with uh, vegetarianism, veganism. They sort of wanted to push that on the on the, I guess, the Hitler youth or something like that. That was something you alluded to. Was there did did they continue to push for that? Was that something that was just passing or was that a, a kind of a common theme for those guys? Yeah, no, they, I mean, Hitler, Himmler, and many of the others were, were really obsessed with, uh, you know, vegetarian diets and all, all natural diets. And, um, you know, it sort of fits if you, you know, take a step back and, and I was very, interested in uh, in one particular book called The Nazi War on Cancer by the Stanford historian uh, Robert Proctor. And he says that, you know, probably the best way to understand the Nazi mentality is as it's sort of a vast hygienic project that everything has to be pure. And so, you know, the food had to be as pure as possible in their minds and all diseases had to be sort of eradicated so the Nazi Aryan body could be pure. And they wanted to get rid of Jews because they were one more impurity in, in this Nazi mentality. So they, they put food into this frame, same framework and they saw, you know, sort of meat as, you know, and this is sort of a, an ancient trope that, you know, I'm sure you know more about than I do how long these, you know, biases against meat have gone on in the sense of impurity. But that was, 
I think, a, a rejection uh, of meat in the context of being impure. And, you know, Hitler sort of dreamed of this vegetarian utopia. They were going to invade the Soviet Union and have farms and natural food. So it's um, yeah, it's kind of frightening to see it all in that context. And, uh, and a lot of the um, in the post-war movement, you know, the Nazis were left behind. But a lot of, you know, the key thinkers in Germany have been former Nazis. And you see some of these ideological tendencies carrying over. Yeah, one of the, and I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm almost through the book and, you know, you talk about, you know, how sort of Warburg's metabolic theories on cancer were being entertained. The biochemistry was, was still interesting until 1960s or so. And then, you know, you've got this genetic model, you know, Watson Crick and, and the DNA being discovered in like fifties and so on and so forth. And just not because there wasn't any science there, but because it just wasn't exciting anymore, I guess. Is that is that kind of what happened? People said, well, we've got this new exciting technology. We're going to pursue that. And, and biochemistry is kind of boring. Uh, but then now there's been a resurgence. Uh, so can you talk about how that how that sort of how it died, I guess? Sure. Yeah, I think a number of different factors played into it. Uh, one was that, you know, Warburg, you know, as, as you mentioned, was a difficult personality. And since he was sort of, you know, so strongly associated with the metabolic views when people disliked him, they also sort of disliked the science and couldn't separate the two. And in some cases, you know, Warburg really damaged the theory himself by making extreme claims that he couldn't back up, that it was the only thing that mattered and, you know, anything that didn't have to do with this metabolic shift that cancer cells do it is completely irrelevant. So he, he, he harmed the cause himself to some extent, but at I think the biggest issue, and, and also people were suspicious of him as being a Nazi collaborator because he had survived. And, you know, that be, that lingered for many years. A lot of uh, Jewish scientists in particular were suspicious of him. Uh, Robert Weinberg, uh, who was very open about the fact that he was had doubts about Warburg, and he became sort of one of the key players to, uh, you know, establish the uh, sort of genetic uh, um paradigm of cancer research. And, and to his credit, he, he was very open about that and actually endorsed my book and, and was very generous. But, um, you know, I, I think the biggest issue was just that, you know, science naturally goes on these sort of pendulum swings where there's something new and exciting comes along and then everything before it is boring and uninteresting. Uh, so, you know, they'd start to refer to Warburg's research and the enzymes he worked on as, you know, quote unquote, housekeeping enzymes. And everything that was new and exciting was, you know, sort of tracing these genetic pathways through the cell. And, you know, of course, you know, if you just stop and think about it, then metabolism has to be connected to all this, but it was just sort of such a, a narrow view that, that nobody wanted to think about the metallic sides of thing until the late nineties, when really what happens is these researchers are, are tracing these sort of pathways through the cell, you know, one protein to another, understanding how a mutation causes, you know, a chain of events. And, it sort of naturally led them back to the metabolic reactions. And then, uh, you know, all of a sudden they found themselves studying Warburg's research. So it's kind of a, a synthesis. And what they, what they really came to appreciate is the key mutations that had been associated with cancer. These, you know, oncogenes actually were, were very often the most important ones were metabolic enzymes uh, that were allowing the cell to take up more glucose and to shift to this fermentation. So basically, you know, their science led them right back to Warburg. And, you know, and then there's this meta question of, of sort of the chicken and the egg, which comes first. And I, and I think there's good evidence that the metabolic problems are at the origin of cancer. And that a lot of, you know, what happens next is, is part of the evolution, but it is not the key sort of step at the beginning. Yeah. I mean, I've had the opportunity to interview uh, uh, Tom uh, Seyfried uh, se several times. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with him if you've done yeah, some yeah. of the research in this. And uh, just for those that maybe uh, don't know what we're talking about, or, you know, what is sort of the, the current or, or the metabolic thought around cancer with regard to family fermentation? Maybe you can describe that to, to, to the extent that you, you realize and understanding you're not a research scientist, but you've done yeah. a lot of extensive reading about this. So how would you describe what that theory is. And I'll call it a theory because I don't know that it's been proven yet, but certainly it's compelling. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I should stress that, you know, <laughs> I'm a journalist and, and Seafried and, and others you've spoken to are actually scientists studying this. So I, you know, I don't have that level of expertise, but, you know, I, I started with, you know, reading about and learning about Otto Warburg's research and, you know, his sort of fundamental discovery took place in, in 1923. And he found that cancer cells, 
or taking up a lot of glucose more than a normal cell. And instead of burning it with oxygen, as you would expect in the mitochondria, the quote unquote power center of the cell, they were instead fermenting it, uh, turning it into lactic acid, uh, you know, the same process that microorganisms use, you know, in some cases that gives us alcohol, other organisms, just like our cells produce lactic acid, you know, we get yogurt, etc. So um, that's what, um, you know, Warburg started with. And then, um, you know, the question in everybody's mind at the time is, you know, if this is as important as Warburg says, what causes this shift to fermentation? And, and Warburg thought that uh, what happened is that uh, carcinogens in our environment poison the cell and damage the mitochondria. And that ultimately leads to a shift to, um, you know, fermenting. And I think that um, that's the model broadly speaking, that Seafried adopts, not necessarily that it's this or that carcinogen, but that there's some sort of problem with the mitochondria and that uh, the switch to fermentation is almost, you know, the metaphor I use in the book is like a backup generator that sort of uh, turns on to compensate for what's, you know, the, the lack of energy production or ATP production in the mitochondria. And, um, you know, sometimes it becomes a semantic debate about whether there's actually damage in the mitochondria or the mitochondria has just been using is, you know, being used in a different way to produce building blocks for cells. But the main point is that this shift is very fundamental to what cancer is, uh, this turn to another means of energy production. And, you know, the one area that I focus on that Seafree doesn't focus on quite as much, although, you know, I think you would, I hope, largely agree, is uh, the insulin piece of the puzzle, because you know, that that's what really interested me is why it is that the cancer used to be relatively uncommon, you know, in the first part of the 19th century, and then became more and more common. And so in the last part of the book, and this may be more in the pages you, you haven't read yet, but I, I talk a lot about how, you know, that it could be that diet driven production of insulin is actually, uh, you know, an elevated insulin hyperinsulinemia is actually driving this Warburg metabolism, forcing the cells to essentially take up more glucose and, and metabolize it in the way that, that Warburg showed. And what's been really interesting to see is um, a lot of the research on oncogenes uh, and particularly the work of Lewis Cantley has led the way on this, has shown that um, the mutations that are most common are actually the mutations that respond to insulin, this pathway within the cell, and that cause the cell to shift to this Warburg metabolism. So I think the sort of the most compelling hypothesis in terms of why cancers become more common is that our diets have, have given us excess insulin and this excess insulin is essentially forcing cells into the state of, of over-consuming glucose or allowing them uh, to over-consume glucose and gain a growth advantage. Uh, you know, what, what you find is that a lot of cancer cells are covered with insulin receptors. So, you know, maybe that these cells arise and, you know, have a small growth advantage. And if you had normal insulin levels that they wouldn't necessarily be able to take off and proliferate in the way they do. But once, you know, they have a little extra insulin, they have a little bit of an advantage, survive a little longer, grow a little more. And if you bathe cells in insulin, that's just going to, to sort of accelerate that process. I mean, another example of this is, you know, it's a common for many types of cancer. It's a common recipe when you're, you know, growing the cells in culture to add insulin to the culture. And that's what, you know, it's just a standard practice. A lot of cancer cells won't even grow in culture unless you add insulin. Uh, and then, you know, there's this just incredible epidemiological evidence showing that obesity and cancer are strongly linked. And, um, you know, you see that link directly with insulin levels. And you also can think of it indirectly, whatever causes obesity clearly is playing a huge role in cancer because so we're taking smoking now as the number one cause of preventable cancer. So all you have to say is, okay, uh, excess insulin is causing obesity. Already you have, you know, a really fundamental connection to cancer there. But I think the connection is even more profound than that. I would argue that it's most likely the insulin is driving both the obesity and the cancer. And uh, certainly the inflammation from the obesity doesn't help. But I think the most fundamental thing is that the insulin is driving both at once. Yeah, interesting. You know, when I was doing some re actually some research this morning for a little video I did and looking at heart disease rates, we've seen a pretty 
heart disease mortality in the United States has dropped significantly. It parallels kind of our smoking, you know, decrease as well. They, they go very nicely together. There's some other thoughts on why, you know, better prevention, better uh, uh, treatment for, for mortality. But cancer, 50 years, has, hasn't really changed much. I mean, the, the incidence of cancer is pretty much staying the same. The cancer mortality has not improved significantly. Now, just, just for people that, you know, haven't read your book yet, or uh, you mentioned that cancer was relatively, I mean, it wasn't non-existent you know, in 1905, but, but what were the rates like compared to now? Can you, can you kind of give us an idea how different it was? Yeah, it was pretty dramatically different, uh, in the first part of the, uh, 19th century. And then the, uh, middle of the 19th century, you start to see, uh, cancer become increasingly common, uh, in the middle and the second half in, in Western countries. And so, you know, one of the first famous statements is that, you know, a French doctor said in the 1840s, I believe it was, or 1850s, that cancer seems to be like, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but cancer, uh, like madness, seems to be a disease of civilization. And that's actually the uh, title I thought about for my book, is Disease of Civilization. And then um, you see, you know, throughout every country eating a Western diet continues to uh, see cancer rates go higher and higher into the 20th century. And then, you know, what's really fascinating for a lot of these doctors who are either missionaries or just, you know, working in remote regions, they, they're amazed to see that, you know, some of these populations are virtually cancer free. Uh, the Inuit, uh, you know, basically have no, no cancer. I mean, it's really incredible. Uh, and, you know, we know this because actually, you know, doctors spent years living with them. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, cancer is, been around for thousands of years. I'm sure there are rare cases here and there. So it's not that it didn't exist, but it's clear that something in the way that we live in a modern Western society causes cancer to become much more common. And you see it go hand in hand with obesity and, and diabetes and, and heart disease as well. Now, of course, it doesn't have to be diet. There are lots of things that could contribute to that. But I think the best evidence points to diet. And then that, of course, raises a whole nother question of what it is in our diet specifically. And, and I think the most compelling evidence points to, to sugar in particular, sucrose. Yeah. Let me, let me just interject because, you know, it's interesting because, you know, commonly we all eat. I mean, we don't all smoke. We all aren't, you know, we aren't all coal workers or chimney sweeps. And so, you know, when you look at a commonality across the board, probably, you know, we're, we're all eating something. Um, interestingly, you know, you mentioned that, you know, early 1800s, relatively low rates, and then we see a progression. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the, the, the life expectancies were pretty similar early 1800s to, to the beginning of the 1900s. We didn't see a significant increase in life expectancy because a lot of people would say, well, people are just living longer and therefore more cancer. You know, if, you, if, you, if everybody's, only, if everybody's yeah. dying at 40, you know, the 70-year-olds are getting the cancer. But it seems like between the 1800, maybe 1800 and 1900, life expectancy still is around 40 through that entire time period. So I, maybe I'm wrong on that, but I think that's the case. And then the other question is, I don't, I don't know if you looked at it because there's a question about childhood cancer rates. Have those gone up dramatically? Because, you know, you can't blame childhood cancer rates on longevity, obviously, because, you know, yeah, since the beginning well, of time. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, no, those are good points. And, um, you know, the, during the period that the cancer did become more common, uh, you know, in the, in the second half of the 19th century, life expectancy was getting longer. So, you know, that's something I had to look into in the, in the book. But what I saw is that, um, you know, the biggest factor in extended life expectancy wasn't that people were suddenly living much longer. It was that there was less, uh, fewer people were dying in childhood or yeah, young adults. Yeah. But when you, you know, that, that really changed the averages. But old age, you know, has existed for, you know, tens of thousands of years. And you look at, you know, ancient literature, you see people are not dying at 40. And you know, there's tons of examples of, of, you know, discussions of elderly populations, elderly people. So, and, you know, and by Victorian England, you know, we have similar life expectancies that, you know, we have today. And, um, you know, the, the big difference was really in, uh, you know, eliminating some of the, the deaths in early childhood. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm sure that's, you know, small percentage could be explained by, by old age. And then, you know, I also had to address the question, is this just a question of 
being able to diagnose cancer more easily. And, you know, all these questions have been debated really since the late 19th century. But, um, you know, I spent a whole chapter on this because I think it's, it's so important to show that the, the increase is real and that the increase continued, you know, long after we got reliable diagnostic techniques. And uh, the most famous cancer epidemiologist of the early 20th century, um, you know, wrote, wrote many books about this and examined it very thoroughly. And there was, you know, more or less consensus view that the, the increase was real and that it had something to do was living in, in Western populations. And that became even more clear in the late 20th century when you'd see things, you know, one of the most famous example is uh, Japanese women and breast cancer, where it would be quite rare when they'd come to the United States and, you know, their daughters or granddaughters would have the same rates of breast cancer as, as any American. So just where you lived, you know, could make a dramatic difference. And there are, there are many examples uh, of this in, in the late 20th century. So I think it's, more or less a consensus view that, you know, anywhere from, you know, some people say as low as 40, some say as high as 90, but I would say it's fair to say, you know, in the range of 50 per 70 percent, at least of cancers are caused by something in our environment. And, you know, I think the best evidence points to diet in, in particular, but these, these debates go on, but I think it's easy to forget that, um, you know, such a high percentage are caused by some aspect of how we live and that that's not really controversial or shouldn't be. Yeah. I mean, clearly, I mean, there's a whole host of cancers that are related to obesity, you know, breast, bro prostate, you know, I think GI cancers on and on and on. Do you, um, you okay. So I, you'd sent me yeah, and well, I appreciate this. I, Go ahead. I just wanted to jump in. I apologize. I forgot the second part of your question about, I, I wanted to address that two childhood cancers. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know as much about that, but what is interesting is, you know, there I think the the evidence is that the the risk definitely increases if if a mother has the insulin resistance and elevated insulin. So I, I do think that's an important part of the story in childhood cancers as well. Yeah, that is. You know, probably I'm sure the maternal environment uh, does play a role, and we see a lot of a lot of obese babies being born to, born to diabetic mothers, or, or or I say large for gestational age. You get these 10, 12 pound babies that are that are obviously larger than normal. Uh, and so they come out, you know, insulin resistant and exposed to high levels of glucose in utero. Um, do you, uh, what was I going to ask now? Oh, okay. So you had sent me this, I didn't appreciate saying, you sent me this huge uh, number of articles on sugar consumption. And, 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 you know, I think it goes back to the 1920s and all the ads and all the thoughts around that. What what is you know because you you'd mentioned sugar and I Gary Tobbs has written his book The Case Against Sugar and and people will you know back and forth on is sugar causative is it to blame I mean clearly our sugar consumption has gone up dramatically uh, maybe starting in what around the 1600s and then and then skyrocketing since then how has how has that uh, uh, shaped disease in your mind particularly with regard to cancer is there is there a pretty clear linear relationship Yeah I mean. I think it's, you know, pretty strong evidence. I mean, what you see is, you know, you always, of course, have to be wary of correlations. But, um, you know, what you see is that at the same time that all these diseases, obesity, cancer, diabetes, heart disease become more common in, in the late 19th century, the second half of the 90s coincides perfectly with sugar consumption and the, you know, they track pretty steadily throughout the 20th century until, you know, very recently sugar consumption has gone down a little bit. And then some people have used that a, as a counter argument and the response that Gary Taubes has given to that, which I think is a good response is that, you know, you wouldn't, if somebody is smoking 20 cigarettes a day and then goes down to 17, you wouldn't expect, you know, lung cancer to go away. So the, the little bit of cutback we see in the last you know decade or so, I don't think is enough to reverse where we are, but, um, you know, sugar, you know, again, when Gary Tabs, he's says it's always at the scene of the crime, you know, whenever you see a population, you know, start to uh, develop these metabolic problems, it's always, you know, that they're eating a lot of sugar. And, uh, you know, our sugar consumption has just, you know, increased vastly uh, since the, the 19th century. And, uh, you know, all those materials I sent you, you know, are kind of shocking to me because you see that by the 1920s, there's already a panic about how much sugar, you know, people were eating. And now we eat vastly more than that. And, and what I showed in that Twitter thread 
uh, which is actually not in Ravenous. This is kind of new research that I came across, but that uh, there was actually a surplus of sugar uh, in 19, uh, in the late 1920s. And the industry was very worried that this extra supply was going to make it, you know, worth nothing. And they had to do something about it. They either had to cut back the supply or increase the demand. So there's this very conscious campaign to increase demand. They said, you know, explicitly, if we can get Americans to eat 20 more pounds each a year, we'll solve this problem, keep the price of sugar up. And uh, sure enough, you know, it, it works. They have, you know, dozens and dozens of different articles and newspapers and hundreds of different newspapers teaching people how they can use sugar in different ways, telling them that it's a health food that prevents all sorts of conditions. Um, and, and, and it worked, you know, we, we eat vastly more sugar and um, it is tricky to, you know, point to any one food and say that causes cancer. You know, the, the difference with smoking is quite clear because, you know, when you're doing smoking epidemiology, you can say, you know, this person either smoked or didn't smoke and, you know, look at who got cancer and who didn't, that's kind of easy. But when you're dealing with diet, you know, people are eating dozens of different foods and it's so hard to separate one out. You can't really do a controlled trial where you have people eat sugar for 20 years and another group not eat sugar. So for me, the most compelling evidence was the basic science linking sugar to insulin. And I think that science, I mean, to elevated insulin and, and insulin resistance, and then that insulin, sugar to insulin and insulin to cancer connection was how I sort of worked around this problematic epidemiology to see a more sort of direct causal path. So you have to accept, you know, that, that sugar causes insulin resistance. And, you know, I, I think the evidence is pretty compelling. And then you have to accept that, that insulin is related to cancer and, um, you know, I think that evidence is pretty strong, but actually in more recent years, there's even been new research which shows that, that sugar can fuel cancers, even in the absence of insulin, that, you know, colon cancers and some other actually can take up the uh, fructose and, and actually use that to spur Warburg metabolism. So in a way, I think the evidence is even stronger than what I presented in, in Ravenous. Yeah, I, I wanted to touch on, you know, the state of the state of the landscape in 2022. I mean, as you don't, I, I don't know when you did the research for the book, I'm sure it's in the last year or two, I imagine. But where are we at today with regard to, to people working on this metabolic aspect? I just saw I just saw a startup company just raise sixty seven million dollars to work on nutrition plus other things for cancer cancer treatment. And one of the things they do is talk about suppressing insulin, and then they yeah. they're, they're messing with serine and glycine, and, and I think one of the one other amino acid. But where 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 is the research going today that you're aware of? You know anybody that's really chasing down this this hyperinsulinemia, uh, yeah. Warburg type stuff? Yeah, well, there's sort of, you know, different spheres. You know, I write mostly about prevention, you know, sort of, I make the case in Ravenous that we see this connection between insulin and cancer, and then we should think of insulin as sort of, a, you know, elevated insulin as sort of a carcinogen and try to avoid it. But I shied away from a little bit of the idea of using diet as therapy in Ravenous, not because I'm not interested in it, but I just I feel like the research is sort of at the early stages, you know, so I focus on kind of the basic science, the metabolic enzymes, but then there's this other question of, you know, can we right now use diet uh, as a cancer therapy? And that's, there's a lot of exciting research going on now. And, uh, you know, I think thus far the best evidence is for, uh, you know, certain types of brain cancer in particular are, are responsive, but I think, you know, and it's really too soon to say, and there's a lot of clinical trials going on now, but I think diet is going to soon become a, a very widely used adjuvant therapy, you know, not as a standalone therapy, but in conjunction with chemotherapy and, and other treatments. And that um, it's going to make a big difference in that context, um, you know, for not necessarily for every cancer, certainly, but particularly for those that have been linked to obesity and insulin resistance. And that, you know, is already 13 cancers have been sort of officially linked. And I, I think there are quite a few others that will make that list. And these tend to be, you know, common and deadly cancers. So I think it's going to make a big difference. There are a number of trials going on now uh, with uh, pancreatic cancer and colon cancer. And, um, you know, this company that you mentioned uh, is now raising money for, for some of these trials. And, you know, in some cases, they're restricting amino acids, but I think the most common strategy is likely going to be uh, therapies that, that 
are like the ketogenic diet or that, that keep insulin low. Uh, there are these drugs now that are really promising for some cancers uh, called PI3K inhibitors, which you know essentially block this enzyme that ins- insulin turns on in the cell, but by themselves, they don't seem to work very well. But in mouse models, when you combine the PI3K inhibitor with a ketogenic or low carb diet, it seems to make a very big difference because if you just block the enzyme, Without the diet, then the body naturally responds by just increasing more and more insulin, you know, to try to overcome the block. So if you block this PI3K pathway and keep insulin lower, that seems to be, in mice at least, a potent combination. So I'm very excited to see how that turns out in human trials. You know, it's, it should always be said, of course, that what works in mice does not necessarily work in people, and that's doubly true in cancer therapy. Uh, but, you know... I, I think there, there's a lot of room for, for optimism that uh, cancer is uh, going to respond to dietary treatments in, in an adjuvant context. Yeah, I mean, you're, you know, you're talking to a community of people that are mostly just eating just basically meat for the most part. And, you know, we're seeing all kinds of improvements in, in quality of life and, and disease resor- reversal. We've got people with MS that are going away and, 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 and on and on and on. I see it every day. How confident are you, you know, because you mentioned in the book, you know, the Inuit were free by by you know by a number of examples of things like cancer i mean you mentioned guys like you know obviously vilmar stefansson and then i think albert schweitzer and some of the others how how confident in the evidence of that attack because a lot of people will say you know well we couldn't diagnose it then they they were very crude i mean but like particularly advanced cancer that's not hard to diagnose i mean that's pretty obvious when you see somebody with a advanced case of cancer um it's very very obvious i think you don't need any magic mris or anything like that so what do you think uh your 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 level of confidence is to say that they didn't have that i would say level of confidence (laughs) is quite high because with the inuit you know it wasn't you know it was you know some people were almost obsessed with this question in the late 19th century when you know traveling you know throughout the region and looking for cancer and you know, they even mentioned that, you know, that these populations didn't mind Western doctors. They often walked around, you know, without a lot of clothes on, were happy to be examined. And, you know, these were trained doctors and trained, you know, in some cases they were like ship surgeons that were traveling in these regions and they were, they were looking for cancer and they couldn't find it. And, um, you know, it's it's one stat that, you know, one detail that amazed me as late as 1952, I believe it was, or 53, I think it was 52, uh, they had still not found cancer in Inuit that were uh, leading a traditional lifestyle. By then, many of these populations had been eating Western style and, and they did get cancer. But, in, you know, those that were really eating the traditional lifestyle still were not getting cancer as late as 1952. and um, you know, you see that again and again that, uh, you know, these populations like Albert uh, Schweitzer, you mentioned, you know, he, he goes to Africa, he stays there for decades. The first decade, he doesn't see any cancer, or hardly any. You know, he, he used the word astonished. He was astonished by how little cancer there was. But then, you know, by the end, cancers did arise. You know, they were eating the way that Western people eat and they were getting these cancers. Um, so, you know, I, I think the evidence is very strong. Interestingly, when you look at, you know, Inuit, and I don't know when this started, but I know that they have a very high rate of smoking. I mean, I think they started at age eight and something like 70% of their population smokes. And I don't know, assumingly it was, it was similar back in the 19, early 1900s. Um, uh, and maybe even no lung cancer, which is interesting not to exonerate smoking, but maybe it's, it's smoking plus crappy diet equals lung cancer. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say, uh, have you seen, uh, you know, obviously in the U.S., we've, we've reduced our smoking rates from a high of, I think, 45% in the 1950s, now down to around 15% of a smoke. And yet cancer rates are still the same, across, I mean, across the board, across all cancers. Yeah. Perhaps lung cancer has gone down a little bit. But what are your yeah. thoughts on on that particular aspect? Yeah, I mean, lung cancer has gone down, but it's sort of this, you know, one step forward, two steps back situation where, you know, we're not even, you know, when we make a gain in, in one area, we we lose ground in other areas, you know, these metabolic, you know, obesity related cancers are rising. So it, it's sort of, we're not making progress as a whole. Uh, and then there has, I mean, I, I should say that, you know, there have been a lot of new therapies over the decades that have been celebrated, but, um, 
you know, we're not really making any progress with respect to, you know, the most deadly cancers, you know, the, and, you know, with cancer incidents. So, you know, I think, sm- I think of the smoking as, as a success story, but, you know, the question I always think about is what, it, what will it take to get people to think about diet in the same way they think about smoking or sugar in particular, you know, it seems to me that it's just such a natural part of our lifestyle, heavy sugar consumption that people just can't fathom that it causes cancer. And it was interesting to me to see that that was really, you know, in the 1940s and thirties and, you know, into the 1950s, that was the same attitude about smoking, you know, even, um, the epidemiologists who were originally making the connections to smoking and cancer could hardly believe it because it just seems so natural, so much a part of life. Like, how could this thing be dangerous? And, you know, the really challenging part is that, you know, these things cause cancer, not all at once, you know, but, but over years and decades. And it, it's just very hard to assimilate that knowledge and change our ways when something is so gradual. So I'm optimistic that one day we'll, we'll start to think of sugar as a carcinogen and the way we, we think of smoking, but um, it's hard to get that mindset to sink in. I, I, you know, I, I can't even convince my own family. So it's, uh, it's tough. Yeah, it's interesting. And I remember reading Gary's book on, on the case against sugar, and I was surprised to see that actually sugar was in tobacco. They use it part of the, I think part of the curing process, yeah, which is yeah. interesting. But um, when we, uh, you know, we we had a national campaign to limit smoking. I mean, we, we you know you saw we there was government action and and, and absolutely like when people say uh, you know like we just went through this pandemic and everybody's obese and sick and diabetic and these are people that are by and large getting sick and dying and we don't address that issue. And I just think I look at the smoke the success story we've had with smoking where we actually made a made a, a sort of concerted effort to reduce smoking we did we we clearly cut smoking rates down by you know we're one third of the rate that we used to be two thirds of the people that used to smoke don't smoke anymore i think we could very easily do the same thing with all this garbage food that people are eating why do you think uh i mean do you think the science doesn't indicate that or do you think the desire is not there do you think there's there's just too much corruption and you know conflict of interest to prevent that i mean because surely i mean the big tobacco industries had a lot of a lot of sway back in the 1960s and 70s or they're 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 a big industry so what do you think the difference is yeah yeah it's you know uh you know i i can only speculate you know in the same way as anybody else but i think that uh you know certainly the industry has played a big role in it and um you know garrett you know i mentioned that in that twitter uh stream that i the twitter thread that i put out you know i showed the industry's involvement but you know to really get a full sense of how the sugar industry muddied the science you know you should all read gary Taub's the case against sugar he really maps it and it's really compelling but um you know that article that i i mentioned from the new york times in 1928 which talks about how embedded sugar was in everybody's life by the 1920s it's all the more so now so overcoming you know, sugar is much of a role smoking played in American culture, American life. It's all the more so with sugar. You know, every single celebration in our lives is celebrated with sugar. Every meal ends with sugar. You know, it's amazing to me that this whole idea that you have to have a sugary thing at the end of a meal didn't exist before like 1850. You know, it's a kind of a a modern invention, Uh, but it's so much of a part of our lives that um, it's very hard to convince anybody. And and again, with smoking, the epidemiology is clear. And one epidemiologist said, pointing out that smoking causes cancer is like a turkey shoot, you know, but with sugar, you know, you're eating 10 or 20 other things. Uh, it's very hard to, to make the case as strongly. And you have to do this sort of workaround, you know, which I talked about. It's not a workaround, but it's just a different type, different way of thinking about it. You know, this A equals B, B equals C, sugar equals insulin resistance, insulin resistance equals cancer is is a way, I think, to think about it. But, you know, this whole idea of insulin and cancer still isn't even in in the mainstream of cancer science. You know, there are many people researching it, it's gaining more ground, but, you know, the average oncologist said, you know, that's, that's kind of an interesting area of research. We don't know enough about that yet. So, there's still a long way to go scientifically, but you know the harder problem is just you know how you how you change a culture um, that uh, is really so centered around sugar. You know, I have children, and there's hardly a day passes where they're not even outside of the house being offered 
sugar in some way, shape or form, either at school or at an event or a party or a friend's house. You know, it's just everywhere at all times. Yeah, no, it's definitely ubiquitous. And if we were, if we were to, if you'd assume it were an addictive drug and it were regulated like heroin or something like that, but instead it's celebrated, it's extremely cheap and it's, it's basically pushed upon you. So it's a tough one to get away from in research. I, I will, oh, go ahead, Sam. Uh, I, say, I will say that, uh, you know, there's some, there's an interesting debate about whether these sugar substitutes, you know, are a path you know, like to, to break in the addiction you know, some people, you know, in the low carb keto carnivore community, I think are, are pretty against them. I'm not sure exactly where you stand, but I'm open to the idea that that, that could be a path forward that getting a substitute that, you know, satisfies some of this need for sugar, but doesn't have the metabolic effects, you know, could be a tool, you know, it's not ideal, but, you know, could be, you know, given the state of affairs that could be a way forward. Yeah, I think it's fair to say we probably don't know for sure, but I mean, there's, I mean, clearly if we say sugar is, and again, we don't know for sure that either, but if you believe that that's clearly the problem, then maybe it's the lesser of two evils, perhaps. Yeah. Um, in researching this book and writing this book, did you, were there any personal shifts that you made, any any sort of lifestyle or dietary shifts that you ended up making as a result of doing the research on this book? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I was already interested in low carb and eating relatively low carb diet um, before I started, but, uh, you know, the more I dug into the research, the more, uh, you know, sugar and, you know, refined carbs started to scare me, you know, and it, it's interesting, you know, for whatever reason, I have, I have diabetes in my family and, you know, I find diabetes <laughs> scary and want to avoid that, but nothing, you know, to me, at least nothing is scarier than cancer. So the more you see the cancer stuff, the more you hear, you know, leading researchers like, you know, Lewis Canley is, you know, really one of the more brilliant researchers I've inter interviewed. And, you know, he said, you know, sugar scares me. That's a direct quote. Uh, you know, this is a guy who's in the lab every day, you know, feeding fructose and sucrose to mice. And um, so it, it scares me. And it's, it's, it's funny, though, that, um, you know, sometimes, you know, my diet trails off a little bit and, you know, and I go back and have to do an interview like this. And I'm like, oh yeah, like I have to, I have to remember, like, you know, if you, if you don't, when I was immersed in the book, you know, and reading about it every day, it's one thing, but it's very easy to, to lose that, that sort of, you know, sort of visceral nervousness of, about the nutrition at, at times. So um, I do, I do need reminders myself at times, but um, you know, the, the nice thing I, I suppose is that, you know, if you, have uh if you are metabolically healthy and um you know you're not insulin resistance then it's not the sort of thing like you know where you're getting radiation where you're going to suddenly like cause cancer by one event you know i think you know some people can do fine with, with some amount of, of carbs and sugar if they're able to not become addicted and if they're metabolically healthy but um you know it, it, i think it's important to to read up and, and keep it front and center in your head yeah, you met what Lewis Canley, where is he located at? Uh, I believe he, he was at Wild Cornell, but he just moved to Dana Farber. But uh, he is, you know, I think he's going to win a Nobel Prize one day. He is really the, the, the discoverer of what insulin does inside of a cell. You know, this, first he found this PI3K uh, enzyme and then showed how fundamental it is to cancer. And so they, you know, he discovered this and then they started. In the early 2000s, they started sequencing tumors and, you know, they found that, you know, it's kind of surprising that the most common mutations of all were in this very pathway that, that he discovered that responds to insulin. So um, he's now, uh, you know, really on diet as well and, and is involved in this company that you mentioned where they're looking at targeting diets to specific cancers. So many, I think, will end up getting low carb or ketogenic diets, but others, you know, might be limited in one specific amino acid or another, depending on the mutation they have and, and the type of cancer. And interestingly, uh, one of the people working with, with Canley on this is uh, Mukherjee, who wrote The Emperor of All Maladies, uh, you know, really fascinating history of cancer. But, you know, I respect him a lot. I think he's a great writer, but I took him to task a little bit for not focusing on Warburg and diet and but he's really come around and is, is now leading the charge on, on a lot of this stuff. 
How how has the book been received so far? I mean, a lot of you know, there's a there's a lot of criticism. If you criticize sugar, there's a lot of criticism on you. And I I don't know. Again, I don't know if that was the main focus of the books. I haven't finished the whole thing. But has there been any you know pushback sort of thing? It's Warburg was crazy. Are you getting any residual on that, or what, what's been the response so far? Yeah, there have been a few things here and there. I mean, overall, <laughs> the response has been uh, really positive, and I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And you know, particularly within the um, sort of low carb carnivore keto community, there's been a lot of people who, you know, have been responsive to the message and enthusiastic about the book. And, and I appreciate that. Uh, you know, at the, at the uh, same time, I, of course, you know, want to to get the message out, not to people that already have some familiarity mm -hmm. with this, but, you know, to to a larger community. And a lot of times the, the responses I, I'm most happy about is somebody who has no familiarity with, you know, doesn't even know what insulin resistance is or anything before reading the book and then comes to it and has a new appreciation. And I've had some scientists and cancer scientists say that, you know, I, I alerted them to a lot of stuff they didn't know about, which is, you know, really flattering. And, you know, one cancer scientist um, said to me that, uh, you know, as he was reading the book, he was eating a piece of carrot cake and he, he sort of put it aside. I thought that was a nice, a nice compliment. Um, but you know, with all these things, you know, anybody who's in this sort of world who's woken up to, you know, the metabolic problems in, in our society uh, has the question of, you know, what it takes to to get the message out to a larger community. So I, I'm kind of fascinated by that question of, you know, why, why it sort of clicks in the head of, of some people rather than others, you know, when you see the same bit of evidence and, and some people you know, just don't seem concerned about it. and other people think, you know, oh my gosh, like what's, what's happening to our society. And, um, I don't know exactly what it takes to make it click. And again, this touches on the smoking, like how is it that people finally sort of got this message? But, um, I do think that, you know, part of the problem is, you know, I've already mentioned a little bit is that, um, it happened so slowly, you know, over decades, you know, if suddenly we woke up overnight and, vastly more people had cancer and diabetes it would be like the response to COVID and everybody would, would, you know, be desperate to figure it out, but it happened slowly, slowly, slowly over, you know, 150 years. And so there was never a moment where everybody woke up and said, Oh my God, what's happened. And so I think, you know, we need to, to somehow get this message out and make people realize that it happened. It just happened slowly. Yeah. I mean, and the good news is, I mean, smoking is addictive. I mean, we know that tobacco nicotine is very addictive for a lot of people. And yet we were able to convince, you know, X number of millions yeah. of Americans to stop. And so yeah. just like a lot of people are more or less addicted to sugar and sugary foods, probably sugary foods more than sugar itself. Um, I think it's, it's doable for sure. Um, it, do you have, is this, I mean, I guess you said you're a professor of, of, of creative writing at, at, at Johns Hopkins. Are you more books in the work or is this, do you plan on writing some more? Have you written others in the past besides this one? Yeah. Uh, I, have, I mean, this is my <laughs> first science book. I've written a lot of science articles and um i'm thinking about actually doing another book on on stephenson because uh you know i like adventure stories and exploration stories and that would also you know cover a lot of the science and about diet and the carnivore diet as well that you know he was such a key promoter of but um you know <laughs> the this book ravenous you know it was an intense effort over many years so I've, I felt a little burned out on, on some of the research process and I'm, I'm teaching a lot more now. So we'll see. In the, in the meantime, I'm actually, you know, working on some fiction, which I, I like to do in my, my spare time, but, uh, I will, I will get back to it at some point. Um, but, uh, it, it took a lot of stamina. So I'm sort of recovering still. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I've written a book, uh, no intention ever, I mean, I have no desire, no intention but in, in my life to, to ever do that. But I, the publisher actually asked me to write something. So I did, but, um, well, let me ask Sam, it's been a pleasure chatting with you and, you know, I encourage everybody to get this book ravenous. It's a great read. It's, 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 it's fun to read. Not, not only you learn a lot, but it's also enjoyable and, and great. You know, it's always nice when somebody can tell a story in a way that compels you and you've done that wonderfully. Where do people go to find out more about you on social media? Where do they pick up the book at? at anything you want to want to share for people to find out stuff? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I'm on uh, Twitter is where I'm most active on, on social media. Uh, so it's Sam uh, at Sam underscore Apple one on Twitter. And I have a website, uh, samapple.com. And, you know, the book 
I hope is available wherever books are sold, certainly available on Amazon. Um, and um, yeah, no, I just uh, really appreciate you having me on. And, uh, you know, when I, I noticed when, whenever you mention the book, like the, the sales jump up. So you, you have a huge influence. I'm really grateful for that. Well, good. I'm glad we can help. You know, like I said, anybody gets more information out there. And, you know, if you end up doing a book on Stefanson or uh, carnivore stuff, I, I know some people that would be, I think, very helpful as far as resources for you. They, they've done tremendous work compiling all the historical stuff. So it might be fun to connect you. So just let me know. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you so much, Sam. I appreciate it. Um, we'll be back again tomorrow, guys. You guys have a great rest of your day. And thanks, Sam. And keep up the good work. Uh, thanks so much. All Bye, right. everybody. Bye, guys.